Welcome everyone. Please note that this session is being recorded in its entirety. Thank you for joining the Fire Protection Engineering Department today for this 20th anniversary commemoration of the 9-11 tragedy. We are grateful to have so many faculty, staff, students and alumni of the department and university, along with friends of the same joining us today. To assure that our virtual attendees have the best viewing experience, I recommend that you change the pull down menu on view typically on the upper right hand corner of your screen to speaker view or gallery view so that you can better see your screen. All questions should please be held until the end of the presentations, which should last until approximately 1235 PM. Before we begin, let us take a silent moment to honor those who gave and lost their lives on September 11th, 2001, almost 20 years ago. Thank you. The Department of Fire Protection Engineering is humbled to provide this event today that will highlight a small portion of the events on September 11th, 2001, by specifically following a few people's actions as the day progressed. We will share briefly the involvement that department faculty had and the review of what happened to the towers after the plane crashes. We will hear a review of code and standard changes that came about post 9-11 and finally, an alum will present the growth of the FDNY in the past 20 years after 9-11. Again, please hold all questions until the end of our formal presentations. Dr. Milkey, could you please introduce our first speaker? Dr. Milkey, you're muted. Try again. So um, I'm Jim Milkey, a pleasure to introduce our, our first speaker of the day. Uh, that is uh, Dr. James Perry, Professor Emeritus for the department. Um, Jim's been associated with the department for a little over 30 years now. The, um, he was the first faculty member to sit on the Brian chair line um, and endowed professorship we have here in the department. Uh, he joined us after a career at NIST and retired from there. So he's on to his second retirement, basically, at, at this point. Um, Jim, welcome to the, to the podium and look forward to your presentation. He retired from NIST. That's what oh. <laughs> <laughs> Why is it this movie? Um, you have to excuse me if I'm on the end of all when it comes to the Jews. Do it on this. Yeah, so that was left now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 I'll try to remember that. <laughs> Uh, the scope of this talk today will address the attack on the World Trade Center towers. It will talk about people that were involved that day, some of them. We'll speak to the growth of the fire and illustrate that growth. And then it will have some remarks about the aftermath after the buildings came down. And I think there's some issues for fire detection engineers still to focus on. So I hope I raise your sensitivity in this talk. But for the most part, this talk is meant to be commemorative. And uh, 
Now, this thing occurred on a Tuesday. Most of the East Coast and the entire country was clear in the skies. Or maybe that's why the hijackers took off that day. Uh, you can see an example of the clear sky. It was much like today. Temperature about 8 a.m. was about 60 degrees Fahrenheit in New York City, and people were just going around there. I'm going to talk about some people. These are some of them. And I'll tell you individually how they relate. Peter Gancy Jr., he was the highest ranking uniform choir person in New York City. He was the chief. He became the chief in 1999. I met him around 1994 when he headed the Bureau of Fire Investigation in New York City. We met through the ATF. Uh, he came to a training center, training session of the ATF on fire investigation, and I was there to teach. This was a federal uh, emergency. Or, but it's where, where they train the uh, ATF and uh, other activities except the FBI as one of them. Uh, on that day, he was chief of the department and he was driving around 8 o'clock. Sorry about the jury. But his driver was probably taking a boat. On the other hand, Christian Regenhardt was a plea for the fire service. And that name Regenhardt will come back to this month. He had just graduated from the New York City Fire Department. And he was standing in for someone at the uh, Engine Company 279 in Brooklyn on that day, around that time. He was a smart guy growing up. He went to the Bronx School of Science, High School of Science. If anyone knows anything about New York City, that's a good He served five years in the Marines, getting out as a sergeant. He was following in his father's footsteps. His mother and father, Sally and Al, lived in the Bronx. His sister worked at the Bronx City. Speak up a little bit, please, for the moment. And speak up, please. Right. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you know him. Richard Gabriel, remember that name, Gabriel. He worked in AI. They were on the 103rd floor. So. About 7.15, he left for work. On the west side of New York City with his wife, Monica. Monica left later because she could just walk to work. Richard probably had to take a subway and was in the South Tower probably by 8 a.m. Now, here's somebody that has a very interesting Books have been written about him. There has been an HBO special on John O'Neill. It's called The Moving Tower. John O'Neill was an FBI agent. After 1993, when the same terrorists group, Al Qaeda, tried to knock over the World Trade Center tower by blowing up the truck in the basement, the FBI developed a counter terror, a counter terrorist uh, group. John O'Neill headed that in New York. And he came to have great issues with the FBI and the CIA and how they exchanged information. He was hot on the trail of the same <coughs> terrorists that blew up the coal in Yemen about a year before 9 11. 
but he was thwarted from that, from pursuing that, you know, bureaucratic and political reasons. And he was passed over for uh, being the head of the New York FBI office. So on that, he said, I've had enough. He became the security director of the World Trade Center. And in August, he took that job. His office was in the South Tower. And although he came out of the building, he went back in afterwards. Now, here's the looming tower. You can look up that book. Uh, about the same time that he took that job in August, the FBI office in uh, Minnesota. Colleen Raleigh was the legal head of that office, an FBI agent. And they arrested Mr. Masawi in August. He was one of the terrorists and potential hijackers. They arrested him because he was taking flight lessons and didn't care about landing or taking off. He just wanted to learn how to fly the airplane. They wanted to look at his computer. They were not allowed. So again, bureaucratic things. Uh, you can see she's on Time Magazine Persons of the Year. There were three key women whistleblowers during that year of 2001 and two, and Colleen was one of them. It doesn't pay to be a whistleblower, but it does present the truth to the public, and that's what she did. Had they opened his computer, they probably would have ordered the whole attack. So on 846, these times are precise because people were watching this almost on TV and on cameras all over the place. The North Tower was hit. That's the one with this fire. And it hit the uh, 93rd to, I think, the uh, 98th floors. 99 floors. So there, there were about seven floors involved when the airplane hit. That airplane flew over New York. Monica Gabriel actually was walking to work. Heard the sound of the plane looked up. Keith Gansey, on hearing this, rushed to the World Trade Center and said, Command post. Christian Regenhardt was on a truck. Racing to that scene. Richard Gabriel was on the 103rd floor and wondering now what to do because the plane hit and they needed communications. Communications were very mixed that day, very mixed. He stayed back and forth. John O'Neill was in the South Tower, went back to it. Uh, after the plane hit the North Tower. There's two towers. One is North, number one. Two, the South. They're steel construction. The World Trade Center was designed to have a very large open plan space. I can't do it, but it's, a, it's around the perimeter of the building. And the core of the building has very strong columns, steel columns that take most of the gravity load. The external columns are to rigidize the building, make it wind uh, uh, able, and also support the gravity load. The, uh, the lateral load is by like uh, this These trusses are one inch round cylindrical steel rocks, solid steel rocks. And all of this has to be protected. As you know, as far as engineers know, you have to protect that. Now, when the building was designed, they actually calculated what would happen if the 707 boat plane, about the same of the planes that it's building. What do you do to the building? They calculated the amount. The building would still be structurally sound. 
However, these are structural engineers. They didn't state anything about the fire from the fuel in the waves. <clears throat> the buildings were built over a period of time in the 60s and early 70s. And the fire endurance rating for the structure was set to be two hours at that time. It had been reduced uh, from years previous. Port Authority, Port, Port Authority of New York, from the long with that. They had three stairways in the core of the building. There were no sprinklers when it was first built. But by 1993, they installed sprinklers because they had two fires, arson fires, in 1975. That's difficult to put out. They did cause some damage. So they said they needed sprinklers, but it took a while to do that. At that same time, they found that the original justification for the thickness of insulation on the trusses was wrong. So they, they had to correct it. I think Jim Milky knows more about this. There were stuff in the UL codes at that time in their handbook, and people could look up and see something like the trust from the World Trade Center. It was never tested at the time it was built. But by 1993 or so, you could look up and find something like that in the UL listings. And it said it should be an inch and a half, not a half. If you look at the right one, they didn't have any spray on the deck, which that's what the World Trade Center had no spray on the deck. It should have been two inches. So World Trade Center upgraded one and a half when they had floors vacant. This picture is from 903, but all I want to do is show that when the airplanes hit, there were fireballs. Jet fuel burns inside and outside. If you're a student of fire, you can find the formula in the literature in your handbook that tells you if you know the size of the fireballs, you know how much fuel is burning there. So you can do this calculation yourself and decide how much fuel burns outside the building. Then the rest of the fuel spills over seven floors. And you can take the area of the floor available and say what the burning rate is and how long that takes. That's several minutes. Some of that's still down the elevator and was flaming. And by the distant effect of the elevator, jetted out in the first floor lobby and burnt some people. Now, thereafter, the jet fuel is gone. This is not a special fire of jet fuel. The furniture is burnt, like you see here. That's what this all about. So after that, it's a normal building fire on that floor. The fuel load is very important. The investigation used four, I think it could be as high as 10. And you need to calculate the burning rate because if you know the fuel on the floor, you know the fuel load, you know how long it's going to burn. If the rating for the building is two hours, you hope it doesn't burn long. That's why I have to Steel should be protected. It was, but there's some questions. There should be sufficient egress. Well, in this case, the stairs were blocked. There should be sprinklers. There weren't at the beginning, but then there were, but the aircraft knocked them all out. And some fires occur in buildings where the sprinklers are out by maintenance or by neglect or other, other reasons. Yet, these buildings collapse. 903, this is about 15 minutes later, the second plane came. And that plane hit the south tower, lower down. But again, about eight floors coming in at the angle. The two guys pictured here have a unique story. Stanley Freynaf on the left and uh, Brian Clark on the right heard that crash. 
Stanley was on the phone talking to a colleague in his Chicago office of his company. And the colleague is telling him, you should be out of the building, Stanley. Stanley says, I was out of the building. They told us to leave, but then they told us to come back. Everything's okay now. However, I see a plane coming toward the window. The plane hit, and Stanley dove under his desk. At the same time, when the airplane hit, Brian Clark assembled some of his people on, I think, about the 88th floor. And uh, he said, we got to go down. And they started walking down. They fixed their way A. And stairway A was the only stairway not blocked. And they made it down to around Stanley's level and heard him screaming for help. There was no fire where Stanley was, but there was debris and everything all over the place. So Brian said, let's try to go help them. At the same time, they met people coming up. And he said, you don't want to go down there. There's fire. And we want to get out. So Brian went to help Stanley, and the other people disappeared. They went out, taking Brian's group with them. It shows you how people react in fire. Brian got to Stanley, and they made their way out. Uh, they cut their hands, the tops of their hands, climbing over debris and things like that. And Stanley said, we should be blood brothers. So they put their hands together. And they started taking the stairway down. It's the South Tower of the City. I'm told by people who calculate the airplane in the building, that the shell of the airplane would break up into little pieces, almost like a big shell. You might see some of that in the fall down uh, against the two towers. Now, the heavy objects like the wheels and the engines would go right through the building, and the engines might have been still being propelled. So they were found on the other side of the building. And Maybe they did something, maybe they didn't, but they found their way to the other side of the building. Uh, I never saw any study that tried to trace the trajectory of these and what they might have pulled. Uh, now, both powers are burnt. People watching this early on in the early TV hours uh, thought at first it was an accident. But after the second plane, we knew it was no accident. And most people knew it was Osama bin Laden and Al Qaeda that did this. Brian is heading down. Firefighters are heading up. They started doing this in the north. And these are the floors burning. Now, in the south tower, you have the upper picture. That, that's a trading floor. That's what the complexion of the fuel load looked like. In the North Tower, you had mostly Marsh McLennan offices. The pristine picture shown on the bottom is typically of the Marsh McLennan office. The investigators got that furniture and used that to determine their fuel load. However, you see that there is a file cabinet in the picture. And according to the blueprints, those file cabinets bring the entire perimeter of Marsh McLennan floors. And they were full of paper. There was probably paper on top as well. The investigation in, in calculating the fire did not use the paper in the file cabinets as a fuel load. That is a fact. The fire grew. These photographs are taken from this. These are mainly Bill Pitts had this responsibility. Did a fantastic job of tracing the growth of the fire and the breakage of the windows as the fire progressed on each floor. And you know, as fire protection engineers, that you have to be able to understand how many windows were open. There's a lot of black smoke, 
I estimated one time that the visibility in that black smoke is probably one foot. So even though you see no flames where there's black smoke, there might be flames right behind you. So this gives an indication of where smoke is as, and in some cases flames. Uh, fire dynamics on a space like this, a large span of openings or floor. It's a fully developed fire. So this fire is spreading based on how much fuel is available or how much air is available. Initially, you don't have that much air available. You have a big hole in the building, but you have a big fire to start. So it's likely ventilation. In all of these high rise buildings and in most modern buildings like this, there's a plenum space above. In the case of the World Trade Center, all of these ceiling tiles fell down. So now you're not dealing with an eight foot high ceiling, it's 12 foot high. So that, that's the space you work in. And as you go on in time, this fire is burning for the order of an hour or more. As you go in time, the shell of the building becomes an insulator, almost out of your battery. And therefore, the heat loss decreases and the temperature goes up. And you have a smoke layer almost down to the floor. And the temperature in that smoke layer will be uniform vertically and probably horizontally as well, as you have circulation in minutes and fire lasting over hours. So you see the progress of the fire. Uh, the slide on the left, it's almost an hour, 40 minutes in the north tower. The white smoke. Black smoke. Why the difference? I'm not 100% sure, but those that study fire know if you blow out a candle, you get white smoke and you can ignite it. Is this a condensed water or is that condensed fuel, leftover fuel, from just cooking from this fire? Now, this is a remarkable picture at 9 30. North Tower, this is burning for a 40 minute. Even with an airplane hit, the lower level appears that there's a person. When the airplane hit, it pushed all of the furniture away. So there's no fuel that's burning. You could really be standing there with no fire because air now is coming into that. Open. Seventy-three minutes. The fire is continuing. This is the kind of picture that Pitts and his team were evaluating, and uh, the fire is progressing up the corridors. By the way, these numbers on the vertical here, Bill Pitts used them for uh, the uh, floors. So you see, in the south tower, this is seventy-eight to eighty-three. Uh, Two calls are received on the 93rd floor and the 102nd floor of the South Tower. Callers were indicating that the ceiling was collapsing. <clears throat> now, whether it's the, these panels or whether it's the concrete, I don't know, but that's what they indicated. By that time, Stanley and Brian made their way out. They had a long walk. But at the same time, two firefighters reached the 78th floor. Chief Palmer and Fire Marshal Luther. They reached that floor. That was an uh, uh, elevator, express elevator floor where people change from one express elevator to another. Richard Gabriel was lying under some slab of marble. His colleagues did not get him out. He was trying to leave the building from the 103rd floor, came down to 78. And when the plane hit, 
the normal thing. His colleagues put the gun out and said, you go all the way for the fireplace. Maybe they found her. Maybe they were coming down with her. They have air, they have radio communications from these two firefighters. And I don't know if that's made it public completely, but some people have listened to it. They were on their way down when the South Tower collapsed. Now, when it collapsed, it fell on World Trade Center 3. World Trade Center 3 uh, had within it the Marriott Hotel. Firefighters were meeting there as a staging point to go into the buildings. It's believed that Christian Ringmark was there. I don't think his remains so have ever been. Uh, about this time, each building is estimated that there were 9,000 in each building. So some of them have gotten out in the earliest times. In the South Tower, about 640 died on or above the fire floor. Some, some got out. We saw Sandy and, and Brian. And Chief Gansey was in the basement of the World Church Center where the South Tower fell. He dug his way out. He told other people to get out of here, including the mayor. And he's going to stay with his men fighting the fire in the North Tower. Here's the North Tower. It's uh, after 1015. This is what the fire looks like. You can see it's going up to the 107th floor and beyond. At 1023, eight minutes after this picture was taken, Andrew Rosenblum on the 104th floor calls his wife, picks up the phone. She knows it's in silence. Three minutes later, Tom McGinnis on the 92nd floor, slightly under the fire, says he calls his wife, he's talking to her. He says, I gotta get down on the floor. That's 1026. At 1028, that doesn't collapse. About 1360 perished. I think many of them were probably above the fire floor. In addition, 342 firefighters were killed, among them, Chief Gansey, when the North Tower collapsed. You see, 71 police officers died. The police officers had launched the radios, the firefighters did not. What did the building collapse? South Tower burned for 56 minutes. It had actually three quarters of an inch of insulation. The North Tower, under two minutes, it had double that. Fire rating was two hours. These fires burned for at least 102 minutes. So they would continue to burn. How long? I don't know. But they would continue to burn if the buildings did not go down. When they fell down, people started carving away the steel. Most were sold to Korea and other places. A few were used as monumental structures to commemorate 9-11. The steel was embossed with the code to tell you exactly where it was. These were on the central columns. So while they were taking that steel away from the building, they could have. They, they, they could have identify where it came from and segregated it out according to the fire force. That was not done. Uh, if they had done that and saved that steel on the fire floors for the four elements, they could substantiate what temperature it got to. Because if you have the new steel and the old steel in the fire, the grain size changes. And from that grain size, you could estimate the temperature it got through the fire. So it's forensic evidence. No one wants to say it. Aftermath, three advocacy. Sally Reagan, Christian Paul, emergency. Monica Gabriel, Monica Gabriel, Richard's wife, 
merge. They start fighting. These two particular later ladies wanted to know why they They got missed the funding for the investigation through the congressional science. Maybe people don't realize that or think that that's possible, but I'll show you that not only is it possible, but I'll give you some proof to indicate their statute. 11 advocacy was to get uh, a 9 11 commission. And here we are in front of the Capitol. These investigations didn't start until a year later. This is a NIST investigation. Uh, this said basically the building fell down because when the airplane hit the fire curtain, not, was knocked off all the four columns. They were now bare steel subjected to the fire. And uh, they shortened and made the building fall down. Uh, they said that there was no flaw in the design of the original building. So if the insulation was a half an inch or three quarters or one and a half, there was no problem with that on the process. Uh, there was a report to Congress. It's in this report. I, I urge you to read it. Now, Congress didn't want to read it. They wanted a short version. Maybe you get the short version. This is online, and these testimonies are online. But what you notice on the slide is that the first person speaking to that committee is not this. It's Sally Reaganhart, representing the skyscraper safety committee. I was proud to be a member of that. There's fire protection issues. How was the insulation requirement determined for the steel in the first place? There's no real clear record of that. How significant is the fuel load? This immediately did not use the paper in the bulk cabinets in their calculations. And why does an aircraft knock over all the insulation from the core buildings or columns and not from the trusses? And this makes their calculations trust information. So what I say, let's not forget. Let's not forget in the spirit that we should always remember this and remember it to a sense. But we should always think of it in terms of fire protection and what could be done better and what could be learned from this text and the evidence that exists today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kateri. Very, uh, very thoughtful presentation for sure, and a uh, review of the events of the day um, you know, for sure that is uh, absolutely gripping. Um, let me um, let me pick up, and, and we're in a little bit of a transition here now, um, in a couple of different ways uh, that I'll I'll present, and and uh, I'll be that that bridge of, of sorts from what happened that day to what's going on in the way of changes that have been made uh, in our building codes and standards and what impact uh, these events have had on the uh, fire service and especially at the NY. The, um, the other transition we're gonna do is, is we're hearing that online the audio quality is not very good. It's perhaps the most polite way that could be said from uh, what we're hearing. Um, so Robert is gonna present from our conference room um, and I'm going to uh, do a little dance to give him time to get there while I'm giving my presentation, right? So, and then uh, uh, Chief Jordan will be presenting online anyway. So um, we'll have the benefit of the online presentations here. We've got audio quality in here, which should be okay for us, right? Um, at, at least from the test we did before this started, I, I think we'll be okay with that, as opposed to air, trying to get everybody up and over to, to our conference room. So let me let me talk a little bit about um, the, the role I played in, in that day and over the next uh, nine months after the event. The um, 
I was part of the FEMA team that they got called to provide some initial assessment, collect some initial information uh, about the event of the day and, and provide again some, some initial feedback to Congress. Um, because at the time after this, there was a lot of concern about maybe we shouldn't occupy any high rise buildings anymore. Shut them all down was, was one of the suggestions that came about in, in the media given the events that these are inherently unsafe buildings. So, so our role was, was to, to deal with some, try and understand why, provide an initial assessment of why the buildings collapsed uh, and, and such. You can see the set of organizations that were involved in, associated with this, um, with this effort that FEMA put together the, uh, and included an assortment of uh, private sector organizations, including our SFPE, including ASCE, um, and, and so on, FBA, uh, where Robert just, just retired from, and, and so on. So um, a, a large group of people, there were uh, 25 people as part of this team that did this initial investigation. Um, there were um, two of us that led the, the fire effort, uh, Jonathan Barnett and, and myself. Jonathan was a professor at WPI at, at the time. Um, and um, there were some really noteworthy names and part of this committee from the fire business, uh, including Bud Nelson and, and Dick Wayne, um, very, very uh, prominent names in our industry back in that era that it was a, a pleasure to get a chance to work with them as part of this. I showed the, the um, report from the, from our efforts that uh, was, was, again, it was an interesting, very, very quick turnaround. We were able to get that pushed out in May of the following year. I, I think the initial uh, schedule was six months. Um, so we needed, a, we thought we needed a couple other months to, to get things done. Um, and there were some short-term issues that we got involved in in gathering data gathering some data at least um, of the, uh, the design of the buildings, um, took a look at uh, uh, photos that were available at the time. Uh, happily, the NIST of that uh, investigation and studies that continued after us, uh, they were able to get a plethora of photos, boxes of photos that, to look at um, that, that uh, helped out uh, significantly with, with their investigations. Uh, there was some, um, Again, some of the data we collected was to provide the foundation for NIST and others to conduct their studies um, and, uh, and identify a couple of re uh, possible ideas for simplistic analysis, keyword simplistic, um, as to perhaps what, what led to the collapse of the, of the Twin Towers. Uh, though our study was not devoted solely to the Twin Towers, we were looking at all of the buildings that were affected in Lower Manhattan. So it was the seven buildings associated with the World Trade Center complex. Uh, it was the Bankers Trust building across the street. There was an Amex building. It was that whole area of lower Manhattan that, uh, uh, that we were involved in uh, trying to get some assessment with. Um, we did, uh, one of the, the purposes of our study was to, to take a look at uh, providing some initial thoughts and recommendations for uh, where, where uh, possible upgrades to the building codes and standards should go or where the, what the code committee should be thinking about. Um, can we provide guidance to emergency personnel responding to fires and high risk buildings? Um, you know, those, those sorts of things are all part of our, our scope. Kind of things we did, we, we were, uh, we surveyed the sites. Um, we, we were there uh, as soon as uh, civilian organizations were able to visit the site. And it, 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 the, uh, the site was originally a, uh, a search and rescue operation ongoing uh, for, for a better part of a week after the event that it was a crime scene uh, after that. So uh, at the beginning of October was the, the first opportunity that, that a civilian organization could be there. We were there on October 7th, that was a Saturday, uh, that, that we assembled as a team for the first time. Um, we, we surveyed the sites, walked around the sites, walked through buildings that hadn't collapsed, um, spent, spent uh, several days there, several weekends there, and uh, there were well, many, many trips to New York City uh, to, to uh, walk through and take, take a look at things. We did visit the recycling centers where the, uh, 
for the steel from the site was taken when towers especially was taken. Uh, so we did visit that. This is one shot of that, uh, one photo of that in the bottom right with the, uh, the, the skyline in New York City in the background. Um, the, uh, the, the steel that was stacked up and, and would be not only behind me in taking this photo was uh, easily 30 feet tall and probably a football two or, or two long. Uh, in terms of all the steel that had been collected. We were able to review videotapes from the event, largely media coverage, such as uh, JQ provides, provided some still photos of. Um, we had some photographs at the time. We, like I say, we looked at plans and engineering documents, looked at aircraft data uh, from Boeing. So what's a Boeing 767 look like? What's its profile look like? How does it compare that at 707 that uh, the designers did the initial study of um, for example, what kind of speeds and, and all that we were able to listen to audio tapes from uh, New York City Emergency Operations. Do some there were some elementary analyses done um, in terms of uh, on the fire side, for example, how much fuel was consumed in those fireballs you saw in the photos. Um, so we did did some simplistic analyses there uh, using sort of things that, that an FD covers these days in the fire dynamics course. Um, we, uh, there were some simple structural analyses done uh, by, the, by the structural engineers that accounted for uh, those, those column sections or column lines where we could visibly see the columns were broken uh, on, that, that, on those outside walls. There were some lab analyses done of steel metallurgical analyses done at Lehigh. Um, one of our team members, John Fisher, was a professor at Lehigh. So uh, there were uh, some samples taken to, to that lab that was that um, uh, something that he had the capability to do and, and was uh, closer than bring it down here to Maryland for, for doing similar kind of things. Um, the elementary analysis, there was fire modeling done of uh, WPC 1 and 2. It was, again, the very initial stages of, of trying to understand uh, fire behavior in those uh, 57 minutes at 100 two minutes in the, in the two towers, respectively. Uh, these were uh, FDS simulations that were done and, and basically tried to uh, match the, the calculations to smoke plumes uh, that, that they could see in the photographs and see if they could get a reasonable match to be able to, to have some believability to the simulations. So it did, did look at temperature development, rate of energy release, and such as JQ talked about it, and we're done. It, for a, a couple years later, of course, and in much more detail once the NIST study got, got underway. Uh, there was some structural modeling and very simple uh, calculations that were done by comparison, nothing nearly as elaborate as done in the major studies that followed ours. Um, and um, again, did the, the lab studies, like I say, for recovered steel from three of the buildings that, that collapsed that day, WPC 1, 2, and 7. And then finally, uh, to, to kick this off to our next, next two speakers, there were some uh, observations that we provided observations from our initial study in the response of buildings of WTC 1 to 7. Um, so Twin Towers being WTC 1 and 2, um, but there are another five buildings that are in that, that general complex um, that, that were there, nine story buildings or so WTC 7 with 42 stories. Uh, the Bankers Trust building across the street that sustains some damage, as well as peripheral buildings, not with the most attention paid to building right across the street from the towers were largely um, impacted by uh, collapsing sections of the towers. Uh, we proposed uh, 24 recommendations altogether um, of changes, of possible changes in building codes, fire standards related to fire resistance testing and analysis, um, and then talk about things for future study which then set the table for that subsequent study conducted by NIST. Uh, so that, that, was, that was our effort that day. Um, far and away, uh, the, the most memorable effort that I ever got involved in, for any of us involved in, in effort, the, the analyses of, of the World Trade Center, um, they're, they're absolutely the, the projects that you, you have the, the strongest memories of far and away compared to any other project that I've ever gotten involved in. And such a such a meaningful set of projects that they get involved in as well. With that, um, I'm I'm hoping Nicole, can you give me a thumbs up? Is Robert in place? Okay. So we are good to go. Time. We are switching the order just a little bit, but thank you, Dr. Milkey. 
I'm now pleased to introduce Joseph Jardin, Assistant Chief of the New York City Fire Department and Chief of Fire Prevention. Chief Jardin, we're glad to have you here with us today virtually. Can you please share your screen for your presentation while I introduce you to our guests? Chief Jardin is a licensed fire protection engineer who formerly worked as a life safety engineer for NFPA and as a fire protection engineer with Bechtel Power Corporation. A graduate of the University of Maryland's fire protection engineering program, Chief Jardin has participated in the Naval Postgraduate School's Homeland Security Executive Leadership Program, has completed FDNY's Fire Officer Management Institute, and completed the FDNY and USMA at West Point Combating Terrorism Program. Okay, hey, good, uh, good, good uh, morning still. Uh, thank you, uh, Nicole, for the introduction. Hopefully my screen is shared. And um, I'm, I'm pleased to be here. Thank you, Jim, Nicole, and, and Katie for allowing me to connect virtually. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to be with you uh, as we are on the eve of the 20th anniversary of 9-11. Um, <clears throat> I hope to have the opportunity to share uh, my take on FDNY's a story, a 20-year story fueled by resolve uh, enthusiastic and responsive leadership and a collective motivation uh, to transform uh, into a better version of an already revered fire service organization. Uh, this story will be more about um, organizational uh, design, growth, and development more so than uh, my, my esteemed colleagues will present on more technical-based uh, uh, lessons learned and, and, and impacts of the, uh, of the event. Um, tomorrow and every fire and EMS station uh, in New York City, there will be six moments of silence and observance of the times uh, of the four plane strikes and the two WTC tower collapses. That's an FDNY practice that has occurred every year since the, um, since the, uh, you know, since the anniversary of the event. Uh, and that will be in addition to uh, numerous uh, memorials taking place in each city, as well as uh, others that are uh, gonna occur uh, it's going to start probably at 0700 tomorrow morning on the Upper West Side on Riverside Drive at the New York City uh, Firefighters Monument. But uh, also thank you to my fellow uh, University of Maryland FPE alum, uh, current students and faculty in attendance. Your participation is symbolic of uh, the University of Maryland's uh, fire, protection engine, uh, fire protection engineering community never forgetting. And that's certainly meaningful to those of us in the uh, FDNY. All right, let's advance and okay, I have a little, there we go. Sorry for that technical breakdown there. So never forget. Um, just show a, a little brief video for some context to build on uh, some of the information and statistics that Dr. Quinteri offered. So let me just qualify a couple of those statistics. Uh, it reported uh, on 343 uh, firefighters that uh, perished that day. And actually that's 343 FDNY members because as again, Dr. Quinteri pointed out, there was a member of our Bureau of Fire Investigation. And I believe there was maybe one or two members of the Bureau of EMS. So uh, that, 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 that those losses were spread uh, across all our bureaus. Um, and it reflected on 252 W, TC-related uh, illnesses, cancers, and other illnesses that led to uh, the loss of life of, of our membership. Uh, when this uh, little video was put together about a week and a half ago, that was the number. It was accurate. But uh, as of today, I believe it's 257. And that's reflective of the rate that the uh, our response and, and operations for uh, rescue and recovery has taken, you know, the toll it's taken on the department. So uh, it continues as we... Um, we, 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 you know, we continue on. Uh, as alluded to again by Dr. Quinteri, uh, we lost a major portion of our executive leadership 
team that day. Uh, as was mentioned, Chief of Department Gansey, uh, the highest uh, ranking civilian uh, member of our organization, uh, the first Deputy Commissioner, Bill Feehan, who at one time had been the Chief of Department, was among those lost, as well as our Assistant Chief of Operations, the then Chief of Fire Prevention, as well as a total of 27 fire chiefs. So had a tremendous impact on the uh, organizational, uh, excuse me, leadership framework of the department. Uh, while we highlight the losses and the, the toll it's taken in terms of, uh, of, of uh, death and illness, just as a reminder, FDNY's response that day to the attacks was perhaps among the most significant rescue operation in the history of the fire service. Uh, thousands upon thousands of individuals were rescued from uh, the towers and the surrounding uh, areas, right, and other buildings. So that was really a success uh, above and beyond, right, the, uh, the, 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 what we focus on, the, the lives lost. Indeed, we celebrate those individuals in New York City uh, every day. Um, so just frame of reference, right? Where were you that day type of thing? So um, as, as was uh, referred to earlier, bright sunny day uh, up here in New York City, beautiful September morning, Tuesday morning, uh, gonna be the start of uh, a two day per week study group uh, frequency for myself and uh, some compadres who are looking to, uh, to pass a lieutenant's test and get promoted to the next rank. And that morning was going to be our start, going to be an all day session. However, I had to get the, my two girls off to school, uh, had to go to Jiffy Lube, get an oil change taken care of. Uh, and that's when I was in the uh, waiting room of Jiffy Lube and a fellow delivering parts. He had uh, air filters and oil filters, walked in and casually mentioned to the Jiffy Lube guy behind the desk and a couple of us in the waiting room that he just heard on the radio that, uh, in fact, a plane had struck one of the World Trade Center towers. Um, and, you know, we looked at him quizzically and quickly we were able to get a radio on and boy, this sounded like it was something, right? Certainly more than just simply a, uh, you know, a small uh, Cessna or something that hit that. Uh, I quickly raced home, uh, caught a glimpse of the news, what was being reported, made a bunch of phone calls, had a plan. And within moments, we were racing to our firehouse as we were making our way in. The department issued a, a full recall, something that was unprecedented. Uh, certainly in my time on the fire department, and I believe unprecedented, unprecedented in the history of the fire department. So um, during our trip in, uh, both towers collapsed. I believe every member of my, uh, my, my group, my, my uh, company made it there within an hour. Um, and we eventually got geared up, grabbed all the tools that were still lying around the firehouse, commandeered a city bus, and we made our way uh, into Lower Manhattan, crossing the Brooklyn Bridge. Right, and I kind of point to the um, an image of the Brooklyn Bridge uh, taken that day as we were making our way into Manhattan. These folks were streaming out, and while none of us, thankfully, has experienced a zombie apocalypse, that certainly uh, you know kind of what was brought to mind, especially when you saw the group that was covered in dust and making their way into Brooklyn from from Lower Manhattan. Uh, beautiful sunny day as we approach the uh, east side of the uh, site, uh, we, it, it, it turned dark. We thought it was night based upon the uh, prevailing direction of the wind and, and, and the plume. And uh, we started traipsing once we got off the bus across the, the dust fields and debris, crossing airplane parts. Uh, we made our way to the other side of the, um, of the, of the site. So we called it initially the site became known as Ground Zero. And again, a beautiful sunny day. And then we went to work and then we were there for the next six to eight months performing rescue, trans, uh, transferring it you know, uh, to, to recovery. And uh, while, you know, long time, I, I, and, I, and I tend to o over the last 20 years, while it seemed like it was yesterday at some times, it was certainly a uh, long time ago. While I remember in general the sights, the sounds, and the smells, I every everything else is kind of a blur, right? But what I do recall was the outpouring of support from the community, the local community, uh, nationwide, worldwide. Uh, every day we would get deliveries of uh, donations and and needed uh, uh, work materials and clothing and and uh, and, and toiletries and uh, and boxes of 
well wishes from school children all over the world. So uh, that that sense of altruism is something that has resonated with me, and uh, and and I look back on fondly. So so what happened to my company that day? My story continues. Um, where are our our guys? Right? Where are our guys? We had seven fellows working in 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 Rescue Two, based in in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, well, se seven members responded, right? And part of our story is six were assigned to work that day. One off-duty member hopped on the rig uh, and responded. And that was common throughout the response to this, uh, this event in every firehouse because uh, this took place right near the change of tours. Uh, unfortunately, it reflects our collective lack of discipline uh, and really served as a barrier to fire ground accountability and, 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 and having a good handle on who indeed was there uh, because we were we we were operationally uh, not as disciplined as maybe we could be. Um, so in addition to the seven fellows I worked with on a regular basis, who uh, we discovered had perished, um, we lost countless colleagues. Uh, and and uh, and in addition to those who we knew who might not have been uh, a member of the department, we certainly had plenty of close friends who were uh, members of the department. And I just highlight on the lower left two colleagues that I knew from hometown, both members of the local uh, volunteer fire department, uh, Ray Meisenheimer on the right and, and Pete Brennan on the left, uh, who, who, who were lost that day. And I kind of connected to because two weeks prior to this event, uh, Ray was helping me install uh, an Anderson a sliding glass door in my home. And the night before on the 10th, the evening of the 10th, I was helping Pete install an Anderson window in, in the home he just purchased, right? So there's that connectivity there. And of course our families were, were, were very close and uh, it made it real for my uh, fifth and sixth grader at the time, right? That this was, uh, that this was something. So that just kind of sets the stage. Uh, so, so I put this picture up, right? This is my view, this is Joe's view. I admit it's maybe a little sarcastic, certainly inflated and embellishes what I, I refer to as our pre 9-11 uh, acceptance of external inputs, right? Like who, who can tell the FDNY what to do? We were a tradition steep depart, uh, department, aggressive uh, interior uh, firefighting department. Uh, we're the big dog. We, we, we develop best practices, right? So who could teach us? Uh, now, now I do freely admit that that's overblown and we were um, engaged in certainly uh, efforts with uh, partners in, in, on many levels and in many directions, but uh, but that was the general sense uh, that, that that I think existed pre 9/11. Well, 9/11 changed that rapidly, um, and and as uh, Robert and Robert Solomon, who, who we'll hear from soon, and Casey Grant reminded me not too long ago, we we lost several members who participated on NFPA technical committees. Um, so so we were somewhat engaged, but I think this story shows how we needed to. Um, accept, embrace uh, partnerships with uh, external stakeholders, external partners to grow the way we have over the last two decades. Um, and, and let me just say that um, our story is influenced by a fire that occurred in uh, June, on, on June 17th in, in 2001. That was Father's Day in Astoria, Queens, fire in the cellar of a hardware store, hardware store that stored um, significant uh, volume of flammable and combustible liquids in the cellar. Uh, first alarm assignment was blown uh, off its feet. Uh, those in the building, those in the street, those on the sidewalk uh, resulted in three line of duty deaths. Um, that fire is sometimes referred to as the forgotten fire because certainly soon thereafter we had this, um, this, this truly large scale major catastrophe. However, firefighter accountability uh, was an aspect in that in that event as well, and we'll get to that. Uh, but uh, for some context, right, the FDNY, uh, we're a fairly large organization, right? 17,000 people, 10,000 uh, uniformed fire personnel or thereabouts, uh, close to 5,000 uh, EMS personnel in our Bureau of EMS and about 2,000 civilians. So we're a pretty big organization, uh, certainly a, a large cruise ship to try to turn, right? So um, keep that in mind as we talk about some of the advances that we made. Uh, so, uh, not long after the 11th, we, we reacted to an offer from McKinsey and company to have them come in and work with us to look at some of our, our practices, our procedures and policies. They spent five months partnered with uh, teams uh, from our leadership uh, at the time. 
and uh, they they spent five months and they developed the report. That report focuses uh, on on providing a number of recommendations. Among them, firefighter accountability, on scene uh, communications improvement, uh, the need to uh, evolve our technology, uh, the need to improve our fire department operations center, and need to enhance our incident command system application, and the need to develop. Uh, what we'll refer to as a, an incident management team. So let me provide just some examples of how we uh, strive to, to meet those recommendations among others. First, uh, fire ground and, and, and mobile communications. Uh, we, we enhanced our communications capability over 20 years. I think we're in the third iteration of portable radio. See a portable radio in the middle. Uh, I think this reflects our current um, model that's in play, digital communications. Uh, hard fought battle, but I think we got to a place where we've enhanced our uh, reliability, interoperability, uh, improved our ability to transmit emergency transmissions uh, over the radio. And so, um, so, so that's one example. Upper right, lower right, uh, examples of what we refer to as post radios. Uh, the lower is a, is a post radio on steroids, but that gives us the ability to operate at much uh, uh, higher wattages. Uh, transmit more powerful messages that certainly uh, assist us in the large complex steel concrete buildings, subterranean locations, including uh, subway tunnels and under rail river tubes that we deal with on a, on a regular basis. And on the left, uh, fairly new, uh, uh, I think a 2014 uh, New York City building code requirement is, uh, is, is an ARC system, auxil auxiliary radio communication system. I believe NFPA 72 refers uh, and or there might be another NFPA standard uh, as an external radio communication system or something like that. So um, now we're seeing these installed on a regular basis there for uh, in building, typically high rise and other large area buildings to assist us in our ability to, to communicate effectively. Um, we, we've improved our training in terms of how to communicate. We, we, we use these um, enhanced uh, tech, tech, technology platforms much better than we used to. We've built a much uh, more robust IT support network, uh, what we call our Bureau of Technology and Data Services. Uh, so they focus on all these, um, all these electronic-based platforms as well as serve as our, uh, our, our IT uh, subject matter experts. And we maintain a committee we call the Fireground uh, Accountability Program that meets twice a month to uh, evaluate the performance of all these platforms that have a role in firefighter safety, right? We're putting a lot of stress on uh, electronic um, adjuncts to what we do. We're well beyond just using pencil and paper to manage uh, manage the scenes of, of fires and other emergencies. As well, we complement that with a robust research and development uh, group that's part of our safety command that is constantly evaluate how we can positively influence our, our fire ground safety, fire ground accountability, and fire ground communications. Um, another way to uh, specifically uh, how we've enhanced fire ground accountability. Uh, old school was to, at the start of a tour, write our writing list on a board, a blackboard in the firehouse, uh, and then um, write it on a piece of paper. And then that piece of paper had a carbon, uh, piece of carbon paper, and so it recorded a copy. Uh, the copy went in the officer's pocket. The original went on the, uh, on the dashboard near the officer's position in the in the fire truck and uh, and that was our approach to firefighter accountability and as i mentioned before we were probably not as disciplined as we should be ensuring that it was simply the assigned uh, personnel who should be a staffing apparatus right during any tour uh, so we've evolved that and we continue to over the last 20 years uh, we have uh, an electronic writing list application where at the start of the tour the officer enters into this application the names of of every member in the positions they staff. It connects to a, another application that reflects what radio they're using. So when they hit their emergency alert button on the radio, uh, we can flag uh, not only what radio it is, but what member that is. We'll know what position that member has. So we should know where in the building that member uh, is operating. So, um, so that's one platform uh, that's displayed on a mobile data terminal in the, in, in the uh, apparatus as well. We have portable versions of that. And more recently, with the last two or three years, we've evolved what we call the incident command application, which you see on the right, which is it's a simple app. It's on all, all our tablets, all our phones, uh, and it allows us not only to uh, 
um, improve our ability to um, manage resources on the scene of a fire or emergency. But uh, you see examples of companies listed here on the left are engines listed in black, generally ladders in red, and chiefs in yellow, and special units in yellow or blue. Uh, but we can show, we can reflect. So this was a house on fire, took a Google image, put it in here, the fire, the, the incident commander has that displayed there, and then he can drag and drop where relatively speaking in the building those units are operating. We can, we can tap the icon itself and pull down the writing list. Uh, so really has uh, greatly enhanced our ability to ensure for uh, fire ground accountability. Uh, another example of leveraging technology. Within the last year or so, we've um, we, we've opened up a or started stood up a uh, a command tactical unit. We refer refer it to. So there 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 are folks who deal with our drones and robotics deploy on second alarm or greater fires and other emergencies and other other events to to serve our needs. We're not like LA County or other departments that uh, Miami Dade who had who had uh, helicopters. Uh, we relied on NYPD for support. So now we have our uh, internal air support um, and, and a great resource from an incident command perspective, providing us with video and, and thermal imaging feeds to the command post. So we don't have to rely simply on uh, reporting from places that we can't see. So uh, a great asset to those of, the, of us that manage fairly large events. They also are, uh, are, are, are deploying robots for certain circumstances, including atmospheric monitoring and, um, and exploring and piloting uh, water rescue resources. Talked about how the McKinsey report recommended improving our incident command system uh, application. Uh, I'll tell you on 9-11, we couldn't spell ICS. Uh, although we think we, we ran fire grounds well, we didn't, uh, we, we, we didn't have a plan that uh, considered uh, a multiple operational period um, event. We weren't good at that, right? So on 9-11, as the story goes, one of the resources that was ordered by the state was an incident management team. Uh, the incident management team came from, I believe it was Colorado, the Southwest incident management team. These were park service folks who showed up in uh, I'm about there, I see. So I'm gonna I'm gonna land this shortly, uh, Nicole. But uh, this incident management team comes with um, with their green pants, yellow shirts, wildfire community. What can they do for us? Well, they, they did a great deal. They they showed us how to organize, structure, to manage operations on the scene, to to facilitate much better communication, and that led to the development of an FDNY incident management team that paid dividends later on for Hurricane Sandy. Um, we we. Our, our folks provided uh, citywide uh, resource management support. Uh, more recently, during the pandemic, uh, oversaw several phases of uh, the city's response to the pandemic, and most recently came back from a, a wildland fire in, um, in uh, Montana, the Wild Creek Fire. Uh, our counterterrorism program uh, on steroids now, uh, image of Joe Pfeiffer there, who was the first arriving battalion chief. Many of you saw the video of his response. He pioneered that counterterrorism program, which gives us much better uh, access to intelligence, uh, partners us with the Joint Terrorism Task Force. Uh, they get involved in exercise design, uh, and we've pioneered rescue task force responses. Education and leadership was another positive outcome. We have access to um, the Naval Postgraduate School Center for Homeland Defense and Security. We Most of our senior executive staff now is either either possesses a master's degree from that institution or an executive leadership um, certificate. Uh, we partake in a Columbia University um, a hosted executive leadership program. Uh, we, we have our internal um, uh, combating terrorism program where we partner with West Point. So we're really, uh, we're really enhancing our leadership capabilities and we have in the last 16, 17 years. Uh, member support services, counseling services unit. Uh, boy, talk about a big need, PTSD, uh, suicide prevention, born from 9-11, a family assistance unit to help with uh, sick and dying and uh, those members who's, who passed and their families. Uh, grown tremendously, a firefighter transport network, which uh, allows us to provide vehicles to have our members who are ill and need medical attention to their to their treatments each and every day, and a ceremonial unit who 
became very, uh, very, very experienced in a short order following 9-11. We partner with many other organizations for many other purposes, uh, certainly NFPA, we're, we're now very invested, involved in the NFPA code standards development process, work closely with, uh, with uh, Underwriters Labs and NIST in, in conducting fire tests, which have led to transformation uh, in terms of uh, uh, the acquisition of fire dynamics knowledge and how we can better uh, change our practices for structural firefighting. And where we think we're contributing to the discussion of uh, cancer risk reduction in the, in the fire service. Uh, ultimately, it's led to uh, a mission statement, which heretofore, which theretofore didn't exist and, and, and a reflection of our values. Uh, and I'll just make this point here, um, really my last slide, that uh, our ability to evolve, grow, become a, a, a much uh, more effective all hazards response organization is based on relationships. And I reflect uh, an image of uh, uh, General McChrystal up there, right? I had the pleasure while I was in the FOMI Fire Officer Management Institute program, that Columbia University uh, facilitated program to hear uh, General McChrystal speak, and we talked about his uh, experience as the uh, JSOC commander in Afghanistan uh, during his last uh, tour, uh, just uh, before he, uh, he he was interviewed for the Rolling Stone magazine. Uh, he, he talked about the importance of relationships when he got in theater and developing relationships to be effective, and I think that's the key, and, and these are just a few of the relationships and, and partners we've made over, over the last 20 years that have led to our success. And I'll just leave with, with two images. One is the uh, iconic flag image. And this fella uh, I worked with closely for, for many years before the attacks and, and every day thereafter, Billy Eisengrein uh, came to be known as Flag Boy, uh, but, but uh, part of the iconic flag picture. And uh, I'm trying to do in 20 minutes, and I apologize, Nicole, for going a couple minutes long, but... Um, National Fall of Firefighters Foundation just produced a video. It's about an hour and you see 23 minute video that provides a comprehensive look at how uh, FDNY has evolved and has become a more resilient organization uh, following the events of 9-11. So uh, I'll just uh, end on that note and thank you, uh, Jim, Nicole, Katie, for the opportunity to speak today. Chief Jordan, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Uh, very, very, uh, very interesting for sure, and, and the, the personal touches were, were just uh, really, uh, really incredible. Um, Want to move on to uh, for our final speaker, uh, and this is uh, Mr. Robert Solomon. He's PE and Chief Development Officer for SLS Consulting Incorporated. Uh, he joined SLS staff after a 34-year career at the National Fire Protection Association. While there, he most recently served as the director of NFK's Built Environment Codes and Fire Protection Systems Group. His department managed two NFK advisory committees dealing with accessibility in high rise buildings. Robert's a graduate of the Fire Protection Engineering Program at the University of Maryland, and we're happy to have him here today. Uh, Robert, uh, thank you from here, please. Uh, though you're, you're remote from us here, but uh, I, I see you, and, and uh, we're looking forward to the presentation. Hey, great. Uh, th thank you very much, Jim. I appreciate it. I get appreciate the opportunity to uh, share some of the kind of code stuff that came out of this whole event. So as Dr. Milky mentioned, um, you know, some people maybe forgot there's this initial study uh, conducted under the guidance of FEMA, um, FEMA 403B report. And to put that in perspective, I don't know if Jim mentioned it, uh, that, that project started late September 2001. This report is issued May 2002, so a very short window for a very complex uh, event that occurred, right? So again, the, the report kind of lays out some initial observations, some initial ideas, but what was critical, I think, was the one way they uh, couched that in chapter eight of that report. It's the highlighted text that said, really before any extensive technical policy, economic study of the concepts uh, have to be performed before any code change recommendations are developed. And, and I think that was one of the things when, uh, again, I remember I was on the NFPA staff at the time, that was one of the things that you, you kind of hear this initial after any of these events or any of these hazards occur, um, you know, that we have to change the code, we have to improve this. 
Uh, and then you always have the other camp that's, you know, well, wait a minute, you know, we, we don't fully understand what has happened here. And I think this was a classic case of that, where there's just this initial fear of high rise buildings. There were discussions in the architectural community. Are we going to continue to build high rise structures from here on out? Um, and then you had the other end of that that said, this is a military style attack. We don't design our public buildings for that. We don't, we really should change anything. And like everything, we, we kind of look for the commonality, the common ground, uh, somewhere in between those two extremes. So months, a couple of months afterwards, then NIST is getting its uh, project lined up. It's kind of putting their uh, internal group together. It's looking at the areas of study. And my view has been that the FEMA report is the, is the document that's gonna serve as the outline, um, if you will, to allow the NIST report to, uh, the NIST study to continue. So Dr. Pinteri said a lot of questions uh, that had to be answered to the extent feasible, the extent possible. So concurrently, you also have Congress working in this thing called the National Construction Safety Team Act. And that, you know, that kind of empowers NIST to do some additional things. Now, you have to remember uh, NIST and back in the day when it was NBS, they did conduct building loss investigations. I think one of the first times I heard about that, it was the, the Hyatt Regency walkway collapse. So they had that ability uh, to do that. The NCST really put some teeth into that and gave them some of these, uh, uh, these this type of authority that you see on the lower left side here. And uh, a couple of things I've, I've taken from some of their reports and some of their presentations. This was kind of the, the path that they were going to take. And I think some of these things are important um, to remind everybody of. I know when I was down at the, uh, the other location before I got, I got relocated up here, um, I saw a lot of very young faces. Uh, um, I, I, I actually teach an undergrad class up in Massachusetts on some of this stuff. And, you know, the, the juniors and seniors I have this year were not born when this happened. So I think it's important, like, like Joe just said, you know, we want to make sure that this kind of stays in front of people for different reasons. In the fire protection engineering world, this has major implications and major impacts on a lot of things that we have done and things we even continue to do. So that was a, a key piece of the NIST investigation was to kind of look at the, these code practices. Um, in other words, what were the prevailing requirements when uh, WTC 1 and 2 were designed, constructed, built? What were the provisions then around that 2001 period? And then moving forward, this report, this investigation report is ultimately going to give us some recommendations around some things that maybe should be changed. So two reports are issued. The first report on buildings one and two comes in September of 2005. Building seven, which was a little bit more complex and in some ways maybe more interesting, came about three years later. So uh, the, the first report, September 2005, really focused on, uh, you know, uh, the sequence of events at Buildings 1 and 2, the, from the initial aircraft impact, the fires, uh, the, the ultimate uh, failure of the buildings. And it came with uh, just incredible detailed studies. Uh, the newer folks in this profession, uh, there are photographs you'll, you can find online where the printed report is, is stacked up. I think it reaches oh, four and a half feet in height. It's approaching 11,000 pages. So no matter if your area in FPE is around human behavior, uh, structural fire engineering, system redundancy, risk analysis, there is so much information um, in, in, in the first report to, uh, you can go in and you can, you can learn about this. You can apply it to other projects or maybe a thesis project, whatever the case might be. Um, building seven, as I mentioned, was a little bit more interesting in some ways because that was strictly a fire. You know, buildings one and two, there's some, you know, the structure is compromised from the impacts. Building seven is essentially an uncontrolled fire uh, that brought that building down around 5.30 uh, on the evening of October 11th. So NIST uh, did, in my, my personal opinion, um, you know, again, I was on the NFPA staff, so I'm not speaking for NFPA or any other organization, but my personal opinion was this did an excellent job of keeping everybody informed, engaging everybody. Um, there was a period uh, probably from 2002 through about 2004 
Uh, NIST would hold regular updates in Lower Manhattan. They'd come in for the day. Um, you, you know, they, we'd get updates from Sean Sunder, who was leading the investigation for NIST, or some of the other scientists and engineers involved. Um, there was opportunity for public input for Q&A. Uh, so my view was they did an, a, an excellent job. And they presented these findings. Um, I don't think you can see the date there, but they presented the findings of the reports, uh, the final reports for buildings one and two in September of 2005. And you see in the, the red box there, you see the, the codes and standards organizations where these recommendations were essentially directed at the chain of acronym groups that are out there. Um, the yellow highlighted box, uh, you see skyscraper safety campaign mentioned there that Dr. Kinteri had, had worked with. So if we go into the recommendations, and we certainly do not have time to go through all of these in any great detail, so I'm just going to pick on a few. But if you look at them, NIST identified these kind of eight topical areas, structural integrity, fire endurance, uh, fire resistance design of structures, and then kind of redundancy reliability of fire protection systems and our egress systems, emergency response, and then kind of uh, these other two around procedures and practices, education and training. And you could even take those and kind of put them in the, in the three buckets I have listed there, kind of structural uh, design issues, system issues like redundancy, reliability, and then operational and maybe even public education type criteria. So you can find uh, the list of the, the raw recommendations in uh, the, uh, the Next Star One report. There's a summary that's only about 350 pages, uh, which kind of does summarize what's in the other 10,000 pages. But if you go into, I believe it's chapter eight or section eight of that report, um, you, you, you will see in there what these 30 recommendations look like. So what this did in the recommendations, um, this is, a, this is a, another table that they maintain on the website. Um, I don't believe this has been updated since about 2011 but they showed a, a list of what the recommendation was on the left side, um, and it goes one through 30, so 30 uh, recommendations. Some of the recommendations might have multiple items in it. So we're probably looking more at maybe 40 uh, items to, to consider. Um, and then on the right column, it was kind of this initial update that groups like NFPA and ICC and ASTM started to kind of fill in like, hey, here's your recommendation, and then this is what we've done to make the change or to bridge that into practice. So in the, in the fire protection world, uh, there's any number of, of organizations that I could, uh, I could list here. Uh, the ones that, of course, you know, I worked most closely with, uh, obviously, were NFPA. Again, I was on, that, on the staff from 1986 till uh, 2020. And then, obviously, there are roles from ICC, from ASTM, uh, ASCE, SFPE, with their guidance documents and some of the other documents that they had been uh, developing at the time or had developed, and then ASME with a particular emphasis on what to do with these elevators. So part of the challenge then at NFPA um, was, you know, seeing the the sheer magnitude of this study and the sheer magnitude of the number of recommendations and the complexity. So the questions at NFPA that we started to ask ourselves, you know, like, wow, okay, you know, we're we going to have somebody read, you know, 10,000 pages and figure out as a staff exercise. Um, and then how do you translate that? How do you take what the investigation tells us? And then how do you start migrating that into any potential the possible code changes? And then the implementation, I've got to get into the process. It's got to get reviewed by a committee. It's got to, you know, get voted up or down. It's got to be revised, tweaked, whatever the case might be. So at NFPA, NFPA has the advantage of these incredible technical committees that, uh, that volunteer their time on any number of topics. Um, and so the staff did start to identify where some of these items were probably going to ultimately end up. But in 2004, um, uh, the NFPA staff working with the Standards Council uh, said, how about another filter somewhere in between? How about a filter that has some of those people that think high-rise buildings are bad, dangerous, maybe should be built, and the people that say, we're not gonna design for the military style attacks. Let, let, let's, let's go find some of them, and then let, let, let's populate a group like that. That ends up being the High-Rise Building Safety Advisory Committee. So they were appointed by the NFPA Standards Council in 2004, 
And then that, that, that was one of our filters that gave people who maybe didn't uh, typically participate in the co-development process. It gave them a way, a voice to come in instead of having to go to a bunch of individual committee meetings uh, that maybe can be a little bit intimidating at times to new people. And there's also a role for the pub ed group at NFPA. Um, within a couple of days, uh, NFPA published the, the FAQ and building evacuation directed at high rise buildings. You know, NFPA would get media calls or calls from the public. Am I safe in this building? Should I move? Should I leave? Uh, you know, what, what, what should I do? So part of the pub ed approach working with the engineering staff at the time was to come up with this FAQ idea about, hey, high rise buildings are pretty safe. This is a extreme event we really don't plan on that but here are the things that you want to consider for your safety um, here's how your evacuation process might work or should work so that was you know there was that interesting dynamic of you know you've got the engineering people sitting with the pub ed people uh sitting with the uh, uh you know the, the people that did the um you know the, the, the other the public face outreaching stuff figured out like, okay, how do we take the geeky engineer language and make that into something that, that's uh, relatable to the lay person that works at a high rise, lives in a high rise or whatever the case might be. So it's some really different, uh, different approaches there. So I'm gonna jump in, I'm gonna look at a couple of these. Like I said, there's, there's 30 um, that came from uh, the September 2005 report, the October 2008 report on building seven, uh, also has a number of recommendations. They were all essentially duplicates for the most part of what we saw from buildings one and two. It did have one additional one, in my, uh, which kind of centered around um, what, what's going on with these, these interesting, these, these transfer columns that uh, the building seven had. It was a bit of a unique design. Um, and so there was another, another additional recommendation for that one. But these are really what are in the, uh, the report for uh, WTC one and two. So again, I've got the recommendation on the left and then kind of a little bit about how the codes and standards organizations kind of address that. And I've done my best to identify, you know, if it was NFA or ICC or is it both or is it, is it ASTM? Um, so what I did, I picked out a handful of these that I think are maybe, maybe most impactful. Uh, other people might say, I don't think that's a big deal or, you know, you didn't mention this one, but I get that. Uh, you know, if, if I do this exercise a month from now, I, I might feel differently too. So I think a couple of things and recommendations for about this uh, you know, criteria about the, the, the fire resistance requirements, the fire resistance rating requirements uh, for high rise buildings. So we've got to remember these recommendations are really in the context of the high rise building environment, but we have learned that, hey, you know, these should be applied to other, uh, other circumstances. You know, some of these things are equally applicable to uh, a four-story building that has an assembly use on the fourth floor, whatever the case might be. So the context is really kind of around high rise, but you know, is I think as everybody moved forward, it's like you know this 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 makes sense in non-high rise buildings as well. So one of the things you know we have this 420 foot uh, special criteria that came into the NFPA and ICC codes, uh, like in the 2000 edition of those uh, of those documents, and that was the thing. Some of these changes were being done in parallel as the NIST investigation was moving forward. Um, you know, there were some things that were changed before that uh, before that report was finalized. But I think there was enough of a sense of where it was probably going, and you know, both in the NFK and ICC process, code development process, you get that you know you get that broad input from a range of uh, stakeholders and groups. So the 420 foot limit is put in, and, and you think that the codes had this traditional definition of a high-rise building more than 75 feet above the lowest level of fire department vehicle access. So if my building was 85 feet, it was a high-rise. And if my building was uh, was 1,285 feet, it was a high-rise. And for the longest time, we didn't have a lot of uh, uh, distinction or, or, or how we we're going to differ differentiate. You know, we worked in that eight-story, oh, yeah, that, that same thing will work in that 120-story building or whatever that height happened to be. So the 420-foot limit came in. That triggers, you know, redundant water supplies. It really triggers uh, extra requirements on the fire service access elevators. It triggers the need maybe for occupant evacuation elevators, some of those things that we will uh, look at momentarily. Fire test protocols. Um, so, you know, here's the, you know, the, the, the NIST recommendation. Um, 
I still get a chuckle, a little bit of a chuckle out of the way they phrase it. Uh, the technical basis for the century old standard, right? So uh, I don't know if, if uh, Mr. Inberg would be happy with that statement, but uh, it is the, that fire test protocol, uh, ASTME 119 has been around a long time. Uh, the question is, is it still reflective of how fires behave and is that time temperature curve still makes sense? So I think, you know, that kind of goes back to should something be done differently with it? And I think to this day, that still is studied, talked about, papers are written about it. Um, we haven't seen any significant changes. On the flip side, we also haven't seen where it's not working. You know, is it, does it reflect maybe modern fire growth curves? Maybe not. Um, but have we seen cases where it's not still doing the job that was intended to do? So I think we'll continue to see uh, that dialogue go on for an indefinite period. Uh, Dr. Quinteri mentioned this one, uh, the, the SFRM, about did it have the right thickness and then what happens when you have this type of uh, building impact, that violent impact, and you break it off or it, it, it sloughs off, whatever the case might be. So here now we see, uh, we see ASTM kind of stepping into that fold to come up with some quality control standards uh, about how the material is prepared um, how it's applied, the equipment that's used to apply it, and so on. If I look at uh, some of the special inspection criteria in the IBC, you know, again, that became a laser-focused area that, hey, folks, you know, this is, this is something we kind of know it's there, and maybe we need to do a little bit more than just walking by it. So it's kind of the adhesion, the thickness, the, uh, the, the, the quality, really, like I said, the quality of how it is being applied to uh, the structural steel systems. And, you know, one of the other groups that, uh, you know, was very passionate about this, it's uh, uh, FCIA, the Firestock Contractors International Association. Uh, these are the, uh, that's the organization that kind of represents the manufacturers of the material and the installers, um, uh, the, the people that do the application. And, you know, they were like, yeah, you know, we, we have people, but, you know, if we can, if we can up their game, uh, that that's, that's great for everybody. So again, there's one that, translated uh, pretty easily into the codes. Um, recommendation eight asks about this uncontrolled building fire scenario. Uh, so that's basically what we had. You know, we, we heard planes hit the building, sprinkler systems knocked out of service for the most part, standpipe systems knocked out of service for the most part. And if you go back in, you know, I guess it is history now, but you go back to 1999 when NFPA uh, incorporated the first uh, provisions around performance-based design and coming up with design fire scenarios. One of the scenarios was design, it's number eight if you look in the life safety code or the NFP building code, it's, you know, um, you're, you're doing evaluation of fire protection systems and the language is not being available, meaning the system didn't work, the system wasn't in service, the system didn't perform. So you're supposed to take that as one of your design fire scenarios and then back out, um, you know, back that out and say, what, what, what's the implication? If that thing I'm relying on doesn't work, then do I have the ability to <clears throat> allow total burnout without a localized or global collapse? And, you know, we, we have seen buildings in the U.S. Uh, perform that way. You know, we can look at Meridian Plaza as one example um, in 1991 and the first interstate bank building uh, out, out in Los Angeles. So, um, you know, so, so we do know that that can happen and with the right construction, um, uh, provisions, we know that we do have the ability to evaluate that. Recommendation nine then, performance-based standards um, around kind of the uh, ability for the structure to resist what this calls, you know, the real fires. And, and this one, I think is, is, you know, I don't know, I look at this as maybe the biggest thing. Uh, there's been this, uh, what I call a long term engagement between FPEs and structural engineers. And there was always that, you know, there, there's that space there. The fire protection engineer can tell me fire growth rates, temperature profiles, all those things. And then the structural engineer has the magic to say, oh, if my, if my structural system or my connection uh, gets this thermal attack, um, I can tell you what the performance is going to be. I can tell you about how the strength is going to degrade or how the connection is going to fail or whatever. So I think this has been, like I said, it's a long-term engagement that's been out there. And I think this recommendation really kind of you know, really got everybody to a pretty good point right now. 
So here is you know just a, a great effort, uh, in particular with uh, with ASCE and I think a lot of the members of SFPE working together. And now the 2016 edition of ASCE seven has the new Appendix E, which kind of does recognize that fire is a is a type of design load for the building, right? It should be like gravity or seismic or wind or uh, water, kind of whatever whatever uh, the design load should be. So I think that was an important first step. And I think this this does get everybody you know a little bit closer to the same point you know because we, we probably don't want fire protection engineers doing structural design and we probably don't want structural engineers doing the fire protection engineering design. So this is a good way I think to uh, to, to get those uh, professions and their concepts and their respective design approaches uh, put put together in one place. So this to me was one of the uh, was one of the biggest ones I think for both professions and I think it. I think it is moving, uh, you know, the FPE profession, uh, you know, forward, and it got, I think it got some new attention on fire protection engineers as well. And then uh, this one, kind of around system uh, redundancy and reliability. Uh, you know, again, this was all directed at you know, the, uh, the, the, the flurry of uh, NFPA documents that kind of cover that. And Again, you know, this is falls short of, you know, it's got to be able to withstand some type of, of huge impact. So it's really about just are there some enhancements and what are the reliability features? So for fire alarm systems, we've had the uh, inspection, testing, and maintenance, the ITM provisions in NFPA 72. For water based systems, we've had the ITM provisions for, uh, for those systems in NFPA 25. So, you know, these all have had some type of, uh, of Kind of ongoing surveillance to make sure the system is still performing. Uh, what I would add to this list today, I would add documents like NFPA 3 on, on commissioning, NFPA 4 and integrated testing. Those are there to show I've got a functioning system that is reliable. And you know, in the case of NFPA 4, I uh, know it, 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 it's, it's going to stay with the building for its life cycle. And now we see NFPA 4, you know, as one of the, uh, the mandatory reference standards of both the NFPA as well as the ICC code. So that's another one where we see uh, where we see things like the, uh, the the reliability really kind of getting ramped up on systems. Uh, recommendation 13 then around the fire alarm and communication systems, uh, um, kind of looking at how the first responders, you know, could benefit from maybe more information or better information or just a different way to get it. So, you know, again, we have, I think, the minimum size now of the fire command center in the codes is 200 square feet. And that, you know, that will get bigger, probably the taller the building's going to go. Um, the features, the panels, the things that are going to be monitored there, the, I think there's up to it's probably about 20, 20 different items, you know, generator status, elevator status, fire alarm status, smoke control, stair pressurization, fire pump status. So again, all these things now kind of get reported back there. You have the concept of the building information card now. Um, that information is going to be in there. As Chief Jarden said, you know, a lot of that stuff is, you know, it, it pops up on a screen, uh, you know, while while they're responding to the fire event. So the, you know, that that's a recommendation. I think we've seen uh, tremendous strides both on the the NFPA as well as the uh, the ICC codes as well. So uh, another big one, um, I put 17 and 21 together. This kind of goes around the uh, uh, the elevator stuff. So we have this uh, great working relationship. This was a, a really awesome project of one of the folks I used to work with at NFPA, who's also retired. Um, you know, was was our lead person on this, and um, you know, he, he would be at this meeting of this uh, this ASME task group, I think I think for a while they met they met every three weeks. It seemed like they, they were trying to come up with their risk assessment. What 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 is it we do to make these elevators available um, prior to phase one recall? You know, in other words, how do we tell people, hey, this elevator we put some new things in it and you can utilize it. So so I think the uh, occupancy evacuation elevator concept uh, is huge historically, and this is this is one of the things I've always been interested in, you know, wow, we're, we're going to do elevator stuff. Well, if you go back and if you're a student of major fires in the U.S., if you go back to the Triangle Sherwood factory fire in 1911, you will see where a number of occupants were actually brought out of that building with freight elevators with the freight elevator operators. 
Um, and then if you look in the proceedings from the NFPA meeting that was held in about 1913, I think it was, the NFPA Committee on Safety to Life laid out about eight different things you have to do to make elevators viable in these taller buildings. Remember the taller buildings back then were 20, 25 stories. So interesting that that concept has been around since literally in the US at least since about 1911. And then we finally get into the codes in, in 2006. And now we've got the, you know, we've got those provisions. We've enhanced the FSAE uh, criteria a little bit. Um, the codes do something different with stairs now. We actually you know there's a provision that you aggregate the, the population from different floors. And if the stair is going to serve more than 2,000 people, then the stair uh, width goes up to a minimum of 56 inches. So again, a completely different approach. Um, so you know, number, location of exits, and things like that, those are all covered in there. And again, part of these changes go back to the need for um, the you know, first responder counterflow. They're going up, occupants are coming down, so we have to keep those in mind. And then I'm just going to go through these other two here. I'm about out of my time limit here. Um, how do we get more information to building occupants? Uh, you know, this is one of the areas that the um, I think the NFPA Herb Sack Committee really took a particular interest in, among many others. And uh, one of the concepts now is a situation awareness. How do you provide timely, accurate information to occupants without overwhelming them? allowing them to make continuous decisions on their safety. And then uh, last one I have here is on the first responder communication systems. Again, uh, Chief Jarden talked about what they've done in New York. Uh, still sometimes an Achilles heel, but you know, between, you know, between BDA systems and things like that, we're always trying to uh, make sure those communication channels are available. I think that's what the FirstNet program does. It can kind of prioritize first responder communications over you know, other civilian use communications in some circumstances. So those are just a handful of those changes. My perspective and my prediction is in 10 years, there'll be another group here um, talking about other things that continue to get refined or changed or fully addressed. So again, thank you very much for the time. And uh, we're gonna go back to Nicole, I think. Thank you. Actually, we're gonna start with Dr. Milkey, who's gonna take oh. some in-person questions. Okay, um, yeah, thank, thank you all for the presentation also. Um, we can, we're, uh, we ran a little long in the presentation, so let's start with, if there is a question in the room from one of our attendees, so uh, we'll start with that, and, or otherwise we'll pass this on to our virtual attendees. Um, so we talked about the changes that have been made for both fire resistance rating and structurally in code, and I know Chief Dardine uh, mentioned that they made changes to just the cancer rate that was found in the responder backboard. Does any of the presenters think we've made sufficient changes to address the 4,000 people that have died in Tonga since then, you know, to these exposure related illnesses? I feel like we haven't talked about anything that's codified to uh, change that. Um, so I, I don't know if that. That was audible to the, to the attendees. Um, the, the question was that if we've, we've done some things in, in regard to increased fire resistance and some of the, the, the items that Robert talked about, but uh, there are still the uh, uh, significant uh, cancer related issues for firefighters, exposures to firefighters. Uh, what, what's been done in that area that recruits that we should pair up them? No. So, uh, Joe, I don't know if that's you or no, Robert, perhaps, who the best person would be to answer that. I think I can catch that, Jim. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. So, uh, yeah, there's been a lot of research, not necessarily, well, I would suspect much research in the built environment uh, arena, but I can, you know, uh, but I can't speak to that. What, what I can speak to is there's been uh, significant research in the last, uh, certainly five or six years to try to quantify and qualify the um, our, our risk as you know an occupational risk based on what's in the fire environment today versus 20, 30, 40 years ago. And so I think there is, we've developed a, a, pr a pretty you know robust body of knowledge so far and that continues in terms of defining our risk and the threat uh, as well as um, steps we can take operationally to minimize that so, so that's been ongoing, and certainly uh, the UL 
you know, fire safety research uh, group and and others have been um, have been very active therein. Very uh, hot item now, uh, you know, in the NFPA standards arena has to do with uh, like a dozen other uh, uh, other um, contexts is PFAS, PFOS in our in our personal protective gear. And so there's been some activity recently in the code development uh, arena on that topic. But I, I, I don't know if that addresses the, uh, the question, but the answer is we're, we're working towards it. And we certainly want to reduce the risk because it's, it's a real risk when you look at the cancer rates uh, of various cancers affecting the first responder community relative to the, uh, the general population. Thank you, Chief Jordan. Uh, Nicole, do you want to pick up a question online, please? I do, and this one's for you again, Chief Jardin. How have the 9-11 events influenced the FDNY's Fire Command Center design requirements? You know, good question. Um, I, I, I haven't been around long enough in, in a leadership capacity, a senior leadership capacity to understand uh, what our fire department operations lacked back then. I'm certainly, certain it's much more robust today, 20 years later. Than it was. We had recently moved into what's now our headquarters building, uh, just before uh, uh, 2001, maybe several years. Uh, but we we do have a, you know, pretty active, uh, well-staffed, uh, act like I said, active fire department operations center, staffed by fire and EMS personnel in contact with uh, with our uh, emergency management and other first response agency partners in the city and federal partners. So, uh, I, you know, design requirements, I'm not sure, uh, but, but that's separate from our, um, our, our, our communications and dispatch uh, operations. It's a, it's a separate group and uh, we've just scaled up our abilities. We replaced a 40 year old uh, CAD, right? Um, Computer aided dispatch system. I don't know if you could call it, it was called Starfire, been around since the seventies and we just replaced it with a uh, a Bureau of Technology and Data Systems uh, developed system that is, uh, is is current day capable, much more so than the you know the, than its predecessor, Starfire. Thank you, Chief Jordan. Uh, we have a question from uh, Jeff Harper: Has the fire test protocol recommendation ever been the subject of any postgraduate thesis work? So that's for you, Dr. Milkey. The um... Nicole, read that once more for me, if you would, please. Sure. The fire test protocol recommendation, has it ever been the subject of any postgraduate thesis work? And maybe Robert would know as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I can say that um, I, I don't recall of uh, one of our um, master's theses that, that involved um, you know, different test protocols, different test environments, so those sort of things. Um, as, as compared to ASDM's uh, test. Professor McCary, you, you were part of the PhD committee, as I believe, for a civil engineering student doing some small scale tests. Yes, but it had uh, nothing to do with the, the standard fire curve. Uh, actually, that student uh, is a full professor at. Uh, the name of the university, but it's in China now, Ming Wang. And uh, he participated in a scale model study that the students from the fire protection engineering department did here. We had 15 students in a laboratory class, and Ming Wang uh, uh, capitalized on that by building small models and putting them in the uh, scale model. Test. So the students actually did a scale model test on the floor as if they were investigating the fire. But so I don't know if you were able to hear that. So there was a small scale, um, a PhD dissertation looking at small scale tests and looking at structural fire protection, not specifically related to the fire exposure. Um, and uh, Professor Terry is also reminding me as part of a junior level lab class in the, the following spring, I think it was. We did a mock-up of the North Tower of, uh, I guess, the, uh, 
the, the structure that's 20 feet by 20 feet or something that in effect we mocked up one of the floors uh, to look at some of the fire behavior in there. So it's a really interesting exercise for, for our students. So another question, question Nicole? Yes, absolutely. Uh, Steve Lohr would like to know or ask each speaker, could you please identify your highest priority, what's next, uncompleted task, based upon your own experiences post 9-11? So maybe we start with Dr. Milkey and then we could go to Chief Jardin and then Robert. I was hoping that would be first, Nicole. Uh, <laughs> um, highest priority. Uh, I, I think the, uh, the highest highest priority that, that we have is, is uh, improving the, the understanding in the, in the structural fire protection world. Um, structural engineering is fairly well advanced. Fire protection engineering is, of course, fairly well advanced. Uh, where the overlap is, is uh, it's not as strong as it, as it could be to understand uh, better the, um, the behavior structures to um, uh, Fully developed fires, uh, especially the connections. There's some additional research into that connection that continues to be an area. So, um, is is um, in my mind the, the weak link in the structural fire engineering world. Chief Jardin, would you like to talk about your what's next uncompleted task? Sure, I think uh, that would be, and I'm not saying it's uh, achievable, readily, readily achievable, especially in New York City with the political environment, but I think the uh, you know, retrospective sprinkler protection of uh, a large inventory of our, of our existing uh, you know, building space, uh, multiple, multiple dwellings, multiple family dwellings. Uh, we still have an incredible number of unsprinklered high-rise office spaces. Uh, there were a couple of laws passed, one in 1973, one in, uh, one in, geez, 90, geez, I forget the date, two, we're 19, 20 years past that date, but, but one that was supposed to kind of uh, amp up uh, local law five at the time was you had a choice to sprinkler or compartment high-rise office buildings, and they positively influenced that 20 years later, kind of influenced by, uh, by 9-11, that, that was a 9-11 influence. And we're still uh, trying to uh, trying to you know, get compliance with that. Department of Buildings in New York City is responsible for for that regulatory oversight. And unfortunately, I don't think we're we're doing the job we should. But I, but 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 that would be my uh, highest priority item. I think that we could we could gain uh, gain a lot in terms of public safety, uh, a hazard that we're we're facing now. And I think we're behind the curve that could benefit from retro sprinkler ordinances, especially in these uh, multiple dwelling environments, is uh, is lithium ion battery fires, and I'm sure you know. I know the the, the, the department is dialed in, but uh, every week the numbers change. But two weeks ago we had uh, more than 60 fires within the last year that were substantive in nature in in multiple family dwellings involving uh, involving either scooter or or e bike. Uh, batteries that, uh, that that were substantial, like I said, two two of which were fatal in nature. And every week, uh, it seems that we're tracking multiple fires involving these lithium ion batteries. So, uh, you know, how do we control that? Do we prohibit this consumer product from being brought into the building, and can we enforce it? Uh, I don't know, but if we retroactively, uh, you know, sprinkler that building, I think that would go a long way to dealing with that specific hazard among all the other ills that exist in these 100, 150 year old uh, uh, buildings that we deal with here in New York City. Thank you, Chief Jordan. Mr. Solomon, would you add? Anything? Yeah, yeah, so I think, yeah, I agree. I, I like Jim's uh, thing on the structural fire engineering. Again, that that long-term engagement, like the range marriage, whatever you want to call it, I think we're, we're off to a good start there. Uh, but I, I pulled up the recommendations, I think one, um, that I think is crucial for all of us. Uh, it's recommendation 29, and that's about uh, uh, development continuing education programs to kind of make sure that the fire protection engineers are kind of trained on some of the structural engineering stuff. And the structural engineers are trained to understand the fire protection piece. So I think I think that's a, a great area that the SFPs made uh, tremendous progress in. But that recommendation also goes on to talk about you know 
to make sure the code officials are brought into that fold, right? So they're, you know, they're going to be asked to kind of review some of these unusual designs that are out there. You know, we're not, we're not gonna, uh, at least I don't think we're going to ever go back to, we have like a, you know, whatever size column covered with this much concrete, or we're going to have this size column, we want to try to keep it exposed, you know, 20 feet off the floor or whatever the case might be. So, you know, we we have these tools and maybe the engineers understand it, but we got to make sure that the architects uh, understand it. And most importantly, we got to make sure that the AHJs, uh, you know, uh, are on board and that we're not just trying to, you know, throw a bunch of garbage at them, right? So I think that that educational opportunity is out there. And that recommendation also talks about, you know, I think in some ways, you know, we need more FPEs, right? Whether they come from this awesome place or, you know, WPI or California or, you know, where, wherever it happens to be, you know, Oklahoma State, you know, you know, the built environment is just, I mean, it's, it's, it's like a rocket. It's going places, you know, we can now theoretically do mass timber structures up to 18 stories, 270 feet in height. Um, you said that to somebody 10 years ago, they said you were crazy, right? And now, and now it's, it's in the building codes. And, you know, it's gonna be an interesting ride to see how well that's received in different jurisdictions, so education. Thank you, Mr. Solomon. I'm sorry, we're actually not gonna be able to take any other questions at this time. Um, I wanna thank uh, a few people who put some comments in uh, regarding their own personal situations. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, and thank you to everyone who attended the event today. Thank you so much for sharing your questions. There was a lot of uh, assistance provided in the chat early on that I was trying to frantically deal with. And so I appreciate your patience. And also again, thank you for sharing your own situations about being in classes with Dr. Milky and Dr. Quintieri. Uh, and thank you to our presenters. We are so very grateful for your time today and for you sharing this with us. Everyone, I hope that you have a good rest of your Friday and uh, I hope that you're able to further celebrate and remember uh, tomorrow as well, the 9-11 tragedy. Thank you so much for your attendance.